when I was uh, hired on to Killing Eve and working with Suzanne Heathcote, uh, who's a British playwright who has been working in the States for a number of years, um, when, when we were hired, I thought, okay, Suzanne, you're going to have to read a lot of scripts now to come up with people for your staff. But I was told by uh, Sigental, uh, the production company, that they already had been doing that. And they actually had, a, they had 10 writers they wanted us to read, which I initially really resented because I thought it was the showrunner's prerogative to, in the United States it is, to find out who it is you're going to read. I mean, you can take suggestions from the studio and the network, but... Um, but basically, but based on your own experiences, you have plenty of people you want to read and, and you, and you want to get as wide a pool as possible. So I, I had a chip on my shoulder when I read these scripts until I read them. And they were terrific. My name is Kay Elliott and I'm Director of High End Television at Screen Skills. Today's session is Writing and Developing International Drama and we're very, very lucky to be joined by Brendan Foley who is an established UK TV writer and producer who works internationally and also Emmy winner Jeff Melvoin. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our uh, fantastic Brendan and Jeff who will take you through today's session. Thanks. Okay. Hey there. Thank you very much Kay from us. And a uh, big thank you to, to Jeff, who's always being asked to, to do such things as today, but uh, he's, he's a fantastic person to have on this, not just as an incredibly well-established showrunner in the States, but also as uh, someone who, among many other things, uh, set up the uh, Writers Guild Showrunner Program, which is the best in the world at what it does. And uh, so between us, we hope we'll be able to make it fairly entertaining. It's, it's covering writing and development internationally. I'll try to stick mainly to the development side and the practicalities of how writing and development happens in uh, different rooms and in different parts of the world. Uh, Jeff's experience is also actually interestingly across both both in LA but also across the uh, the pond more recently working in the UK system so I think that will be fascinating for someone who's doing both. Uh, my experience tends to be uh, extremely international if I have a, a little shtick or, or groove it's that I, I work with uh, international broadcasters and producers currently just in a nutshell I currently have uh, seven series in either development or production in a lot of different countries uh, so US Canada UK uh, Germany Finland uh, quite a lot of work with Finland I see some of my Finnish friends checking in here um, and also in Poland and China. So it, th that's, that's my side of, of the world. I do work in the US system, but a lot less. So Jeff will major on the US UK aspects and I'll try to broaden it out to rest of the world. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, that, as, as Brendan said, my experience has been largely, uh, almost exclusively involved with actually running and writing television shows. Uh, I've done plenty of development, but, but not as successfully as Brendan has recently. Um, and uh, my British experience was recently with Killing Eve. I spent the last season over in, in London having a great time working on that show. And it was quite eye-opening in terms of the distinctions between the two systems, which we'll, which we'll talk about. Um, also, curiously, as, as a bit of a consultant, um, well, for a number of years, I've been asked to talk to various countries' representatives about how to incorporate the American system into uh, the show running model pretty much into their systems, which I find generally is uh, almost an impossible proposition, but nevertheless, there's strong interest in it. What I'm finding curiously, as Brendan and I have talked about, is actually the American system, especially at the high end of premium channels of cable, is beginning to resemble in some ways a little bit more the British system, which we'll go into. But uh, we have a lot to learn from each other. And uh, uh, it's a fascinating time to be involved in TV. Uh, it's a rather bewildering time. Um, I've never seen so much disruption in such a short period, but um, as Brendan particularly can talk about, disruption creates opportunities too. You just have to have the stomach for it. That's, uh, that's part of it. Um, we, we've kind of got a rough agenda here that we're, we want to talk about. Uh, 
and, and I think that as uh, going from the macro a little bit to the micro, uh, it would be good to kind of set the current uh, situation, the TV picture, especially from a UK perspective. And so, Brendan, I turn that kind of over to you to talk about your perspective. You know, well, I, I think everyone here could could do their own session on how hard it is. So we're going to forget about that and just look at the uh, the positive for once, because we are in a, you know, if not a golden age, we're in an amazing time of opportunity and UK riders in particular are, are in a very, very good place. That's not to say it's going to be easy, but let, you know, everyone knows it's hard, so let's concentrate on, uh, on what we can do about it. Um, the, the disruption, not just of the TV industry, but uh, COVID, and that's the first and last mention of the C word that there's going to be in this session, and the... Uh, I mean, the further disruption of Brexit, a lot of massive tectonic changes taking place, and they could be either disastrous or very good. But uh, I'd like to to start with the old the old adage of uh, if if you owe the bank five thousand pounds, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank five million pounds, they've got a problem. <laughs> so we're we're in a, a state in the world where we do we have a remarkable chance to change things, whether within the TV industry or without. So focusing on the the TV industry for a minute, Britain's most amazing uh, opportunity is partly but not entirely explained by by uh, language and the fact that we are in a position where the industry was built around English language productions which found it easier to export themselves. So when you're looking internationally, uh, we've got a, a remarkable chance. So what we're uh, going to be looking at is the place of the SVOD, well, we can start with this one if you like, uh, the place of the UK and the SVODs, but this this particular slide shows what people are watching it's maybe a year or two old but it's the most recent uh one i could dig out these are some of the shows which are being watched in the largest number of european countries so to get on the the sort of top of the pops you have to be in at least 10 having your show seen in at least 10 european countries so okay. this uh this interesting blob represents effectively high-end TV exports. So things that are made in this case, uh, high-end TV that's made in Europe, which is shown outside of Europe, which is shown beyond Europe. And this represents everything that's made in Europe. And you can see the UK weighing in at 64% of everything that sees the light of day on SVOD outside Europe, that's made in Europe. Uh, if you look at some of the other squares there, uh, Spain has 10% because they also have a language advantage. So the Spanish speaking world and South America and so on. So they're quite export heavy. But if you look at say Germany, there is, is, is 4% of the exports outside you know outside the eu so uh we have we have an amazing start position here and with the growth in the industry that can only get better you also not that it's particularly relevant but but sometimes you you see little little areas of growth that uh sort of countries punching above their weight population wise. So if you look down at uh, DK and SE at the bottom right hand, that's Denmark and Sweden. And the reason that they have a relative, I mean, obviously small and relative to uh, the, the UK, but they have a relatively high percentage there because of the success of Nordic Noir uh, in exporting. And one of the, the most recent jobs I did was uh, with Luminoir in Finland on Cold Courage with Lionsgate and uh, Viaplay, which is a Nordic streamer. So that's, that's an example of something that people like that gets exported uh, almost regardless of language. But 
we're, we're sitting on top of this great demand for high-end English language TV. And you can see that no matter what happens, you know, Britain is leading the charge as far as Europe's concerned for SVODs anyway. So I don't know if we have that other slide, Jeff, for the second yeah, one. Yeah. That one covers effectively what, uh, uh, what people are watching in Europe. Uh, there we go. Thank you very much. Glad you're doing it and not me. Otherwise we'd be doomed. <laughs> well, fine anyway. <laughs> uh, so, so this is titles that are screened in the largest number of European countries, and it could be it could be anything made in Europe, America, Britain. It's just the the largest number of countries that are watching the same shows, and you see there in the top. Uh, of the top 21 titles in terms of being watched in 10 or more European countries, they are all, they're essentially all American or British all the way down. Uh, you can see that the US shows are, and this is changing a little bit, but you can, you can look yourself at all the, a lot of them are the sort of meat and potatoes of the business. So uh, from 2017, you know, Hawaii, Five O, Homeland, Law and Order. And what's, uh, and what's worth, I think if I can jump in, what's worth okay. commenting on is that those very shows are the ones that have taken advantage most of what the traditional American show running system is all about. It, it, it's equipped to turn out 22, 24 episodes a year. Back in the 60s, it was 39 episodes a year. Um, and that kind of, uh, as Brendan and I talk about, the factory floor approach has its upside and its downside. But certainly when it comes to international consumption, um, the, the British system, from my observation, which we'll go into next, uh, is not really capable uh, at a high quality level of pumping out um, 22 or 24 episodes in a season. Of course, it's arguable whether these are high quality, but I think from certainly a minimal production value perspective, or minimally from a production value perspective, um, these are all really well done shows. You may not like them. Uh, they may be predictable in certain places, but uh, but it is striking as Brenda and I were looking over this note just to see how many of them come out of that very traditional meat and potatoes uh, school, which actually uh, dates back to forms and disciplines that go back to the days of American radio, which developed a lot of these forms and processes for how to put a lot of quality product out in a short period of time. End of interruption. <laughs> no, that's, that's really useful. And if you look at the uh, the British contenders in that very top popular layer, uh, they they have all the usual suspects. So the night manager, crime is something that travels really well. Uh, Victoria, people love anything which is sort of quintessentially British. Uh, Downton would be another another example. Uh, as an old distributor friend once said to me, so you can sell anything about Britain as long as it's about toughs or toffs. <laughs> so uh, the toffs being the gangsters and the toffs obviously being everyone in the Hugh Grant tradition. Uh, further down, you've got Midsummer Murders and Father Brown, so sort of cosy, you know, cosy British TV. But that will give you an idea of, of uh, what, what is most popular uh, and we, we have plenty of edgy high-end stuff emerging, but there's still this massive enthusiasm for, uh, for UK-made crime and uh, you know, mainstream, mainstream programming. So that's... What's, what's, uh, what, yeah, uh, I also think it's worth noting, for, uh, and, and we can always discuss why, but, but the, the British shows that appear on these lists uh, tend to be very high quality of uh, the quality that we'd consider HBO, high end Netflix, uh, you know, premium cable type of stuff, Sherlock and uh, uh, the night manager, which won the Emmy uh, and so forth. Uh, I mean, Father Brown and Midsummer Murders are more along the lines of the meat and potatoes stuff, but, but there's no, I mean, Homeland is, is a bit of an exception because of its uh, high quality continuing storyline. But most of these shows are what we call one-offs in America. Uh, you don't have to watch it in any particular order, even though there may be continuing character development. Um, they don't uh, depend on you having seen every episode in order in order to follow it. And so still from a popular point of view, uh, the shows that you can just pick up and watch any time and 
as I've been told internationally, if you if, if it's an American show that has California in it, for example, where Hawaii takes you to an exotic location that's a little different than uh, uh, East London in the middle of winter, um, uh, people enjoy yeah. that as well. Yeah, for sure. And then if just just to sort of reinforce what you're saying, so there are these two levels. There is the broad appeal, and then there is what would have been called sort of HBO, the the high end uh, classic stuff, and we'll whatever way we slice this this hour we'll be hopping back and forth but on in terms of the high-end stuff just for a second if you think about you know the crown peter morgan piggy blinders stephen knight bodyguard jed mercurio killing even fleabag phoebe waller bridge black miller black mirror charlie brooker good omens neil gaiman uh you know gentleman jack sally wainwright sherlock mark gaddis and steve moffat all of those are driven by the creative vision of a writer. So it's like a writer who's become a, almost like a brand because of their unique voice. So there are, you know, there are basically two routes into the world. There is having such a unique voice, ideally dem demonstrable in terms of audiences wanting it and liking the success. And there is also hitting those genres which are most popular for for an international audience coming out of the uk so those are two possible routes to yeah well, one of the things that in, in, intrigues me and that uh, brenda and i have talked about is the distinction between even amongst the most popular and accomplished writers in england uh, in the uk is how much actual power production power do they have over the shows that they are working on and uh, uh I had the chance to meet Jed Mercurio. Uh, in fact, Brandon, you were there at that uh, the Writers Guild of Great Britain event that we did, and I was surprised at having a pint with him afterwards to talk about how little impact uh, the success of Bodyguard seemed to have on his ability to get his next show uh, on the air with the BBC. He had to kind of stand in the queue with everybody else, that, uh, um, which in the United States um, would be very different if you had a success on the magnitude of that show. People would be lining up to do uh, to do your next show. Um, but uh, but here, because of the way things are done, because in England, I mean, the way things are done, it, it, uh, it's a different system, which maybe is a good segue. Should we go into the discussion yeah. of distinction? Okay. Um, uh, uh, so I put together a little bit of a slideshow, and I hope it's not too didactic, but uh, Brendan will be free to interrupt me, and we'll talk back and forth across it. So let me see if I can get this uh, going. And uh, so the nature of this is to talk about uh, the distinction between the two systems. And uh, to start with, uh, we have Oscar Wilde, who said we have, have really everything in common with America nowadays, except, of course, language, and to which I, I add show running, which is a uniquely American uh, concept. And the question becomes, why? How is it that our two countries um, do things so differently? And the answer is, is that we have very distinctive histories when it comes to how media um, was handled by them in terms of um, who controls uh, radio and television, um, which involves different economic models, uh, a different culture that, uh, uh, that uh, not only produced the economic models, but then infused the economic model. And, and then the traditions that have become so ingrained that, for example, in, in the UK, I think, even though the BBC has certain attitudes that were very much promulgated by the very setup of, of government control, some of those same attitudes and traditions then permeated the, uh, uh, the more commercial networks, uh, even though they didn't have the same uh, constraints. Um, so when we look at those just categories, uh, and just briefly, in, in England, the government from the beginning has controlled the airwaves. Um, it is, you know, traditionally it was not licensed out to individuals, it was the government who determined what was gonna be on. So the money, how a show was judged, whether a show, uh, since it wasn't dependent on advertising revenue, uh, the money for a show comes from the government, which is a very different way of determining um, who's gonna get what. Uh, yeah, with the BBC in particular, that's, that's true. It's a sort of quasi-government, but it's, it's the opposite of the American free-for-all system. Well, it certainly isn't capitalist and advertising. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I talked to Jed about 
the success of Bodyguard. I said, but surely the, the, you know, the numbers mean something. And he said they played down the numbers to him. And I don't want to misrepresent Jed. I mean, he, uh, but he, he spoke much more uh, specifically uh, naming names than uh, which were causing a lot of chuckles in the audience, names I didn't know. But, uh, but clearly, um, I mean, the BBC must make money from licensing uh, these programs programs to other markets, but it seemed that that kind of commercial aspect of a success wasn't as, as um, I don't know, what their own decision, what, the, what they think the public should or, or, or needs to see. Um, which goes into that point about this Oxbridge ethos, that there's, um, in, in so many ways, uh, the, the, the class system um, the, the cultural divisions that have come up with, that I can't speak about with any expertise just as an outsider, but certainly this whole Oxbridge uh, aspect of, uh, of the BBC influences things for better and for worse. And uh, um, so there's very much, um, at least to these American eyes, there's very much an uh, upper class intellectual aspect to uh, certainly the evolution of the BBC. I don't know where it's at these days. Um, would, would you agree with that, Brendan? Yeah, yeah, I would do. I mean, the uh, this this isn't a day for sort of uh, pondering, uh, you know, some of the deep rooted problems in the UK. But we we talk a lot about diversity, and the one thing that is only just touched on is is a diversity of voices from the entire range of what could loosely be called class. That right. uh, there's there's effectively you you can have a, a, a you know a, quite rightly a, a sort of rainbow coalition of genders and ethnicities and attitudes, but if it was all coming from ten percent of the economic population, then it's not speaking to a wider audience. So I, I'm personally passionate about trying to get voices of of every type, you know, male, female, black, white, young, old, but including people who are from backgrounds who who right. haven't popped out of, of uh, a very narrow background. So that's that's maybe a bit of the downside. You know, we'll, we'll the, the BBC is tricky to talk about because it's like, you know, you're allowed to beat up your own family that we, we you know, love it and we'll fight like lions for it, but we're, we're also crashingly aware of the sort of weaknesses and the uh, some of the you know slowness and basically not, not it's not deliberate but it's it's people people tend to flock to people or experiences which they regard as safe or comfortable. Of course, so yeah. that and I, I think that's it, probably what you're saying. Right, it's not our intent to go narrow and deep on any of these things. In fact, as, as we'll see, the point of this is really to compare and contrast. Uh, you know, each system has its advantages and disadvantages, and, and this aspect is just, we'll compare it to what happens in, in the United States. You have a weaker union environment here than in the UK, and certainly uh, I don't need to tell our listeners about that, but um, that's just a fact that has, uh, that does impinge upon uh, and influence uh, the writer's status. Uh, Essentially, in Britain, the writer is labor, um, as opposed to labor and management. Uh, the, the writer is, so even your most prized writers, it seems to me, are, um, they can be revered for what they're able to put down on paper, but when it comes time for pre-production, production, and post-production, um, uh, the, the, it seems generally that they're kind of patted on the head and said, We're not, you're not needed anymore, uh, which is very different than the American model, and, and has led to certain British writers that I know thinking that the system infantilizes the writer by not uh, allowing the writer more of a hand in the actual production of their own words. In America, uh, from early in the development of television, of radio, and then television, um, the idea was to license the airwaves to private companies. Um, and we could talk forever about the interesting stories and rascals and rogues that were involved in that, but that's just the way things um, uh, un unraveled. I mean, historically, it's interesting. At one point, uh, the uh, during the First World War, uh, there was a lot of discussion in Washington, D.C. about making radio the exclusive province of the government for military purposes. That's just a, an interesting way of showing how technology, uh, when it's emerging, there are a lot of different voices on how to use it, and things could have gone a lot of different ways. Um, 
And in the case of America, it went into the hands of uh, private enterprise. So uh, you were given a license to operate on certain frequencies and uh, and then it was up to you to decide how to sell the airtime. So in a curious way, the um, shows that developed um, were really ways to get people to listen to advertisers. So um, it wasn't like somebody said, and I find this a little different than probably Britain's attitude. The idea wasn't, the idea wasn't let's show people interesting shows or shows they want to watch. Um, it's more like, let's hook people so that they will uh, watch the advertising. It's uh, the, the idea of the content came um, to service the, the, the uh, economic model. Um, consequently, there was kind of, as opposed to the Oxbridge ethos, what I would consider the Wild West cowboy ethos. Anything goes as long as it sells. And uh, that can produce excellent programs and it can also produce terrible programs. But the, but the whole impulse and what shapes the market and what's going to move somebody to change uh, is going to be different than in one where there's a, a, a fair degree of um, creative intellectual judgment being exercised. In, in America, uh, it was much more traditionally just bottom line judgment. Um, we have a much stronger union environment for writers. The Writers Guild uh, was founded very contentiously in the 30s and has built its strength upon some um, powerful strikes, uh, most of which the union arguably has won, some of which we've lost. But the fact is the union is a very strong uh, force. And currently, for example, uh, we took a job action where we were, because we, uh, our leadership decided that the packaging that goes on in the United States in which agencies have a very active role in assembling TV shows and movies, um, that uh, it was decided that that was not in the writer's best interest. And so we were asked to fire all our agents unless they changed their ways. And so right now, a lot of us, and me included, uh, I'm a CAA client, I don't currently have an agent. Um, it's an interesting situation. Um, and as far as the um, showrunner is concerned, the, and, and writers in general, the writer is a writer producer. There is this hyphen it, and uh, it, which makes you both labor and management. So that, uh, as we'll see in, in the next illustration, uh, in America, the, the, the showrunner has tremendous uh, influence that is just not known um, in, in the UK at present. Um, Could I chip in yes. on uh, one one slide? Uh, uh, the writer's labor and management in uh, certainly in the showrunner world and really through through writer's rooms in, in the States, this is the biggest difference. Uh, what you touched on in, in the UK is that our greatest weakness has been that traditionally uh, UK writers have been sort of wrapped in cotton wool or sent off to their attic and then they deliver either on spec or paid a script or a series of scripts, then they're patted on the head, they're given a small bag of money and told to jog on to their next job. In the States, there's a, a completely different idea. There's uh, the idea that uh, writers, even their job titles are often, like an executive producer when I worked in features was you know, someone who got the money but an executive producer in the TV world is is a writer and essentially a writer with some production experience. So we, we you know, with, because of our limited time, we're, we'll broaden this out. But the, the basic thing that drives me nuts is that if you talk to any writer in Britain, they all, 99 out of 100 say, I want to be a showrunner. And it's understandable because there's a sort of illusion that, you know, all right, I want to wear the captain's hat. Can I wear the captain's hat? Yes, yes, I'm the captain. <laughs> but the, the underlying problem with that is that if five minutes later, someone shouts iceberg dead ahead, fewer people are keen to wear the captain's hat. So it's not about, it's not just about creative freedom. The, the showrunner in a U.S. sense has this, a uh, job which is like a hybrid of uh, writer, producer, director. Yeah, and, that, and in fact, let me just jump right into the next section because mm -hmm. it'll illustrate exactly what you're thinking, uh, what you're saying. It's, it's a very, these are, these are responsibilities that are built into the, the differences of, of the two systems. And uh, so here we take a look at the British system and uh, the network and the studio uh, are at the very top, and this is a clear hierarchy. And then look at the next level of responsibility. Let's start on the right with the producer's unit. 
um, that's uh, somebody who's actively involved in approving the scripts and running things. Uh, the director is hugely important. And then on the writing side, the, there's not, the lead writer is not represented or the head writer is not represented at that same tier. It's the script editor, uh, which is a title that, and, a, and a position that just doesn't exist in the United States. And uh, again, th this is all general and there can be exceptions that prove the rule, but, but, but I've, I've done a fair amount of talking with others, but this is certainly my observation from my experience in England that, that the script editor, and there's often a story producer as well, who'd be part of the producer's unit, um, they're the liaisons between the studio and the lead writer. Um, the lead writer is not communicating directly uh, to the studio or network, but communicating through these intermediaries. Uh, the story producer would be on set to handle any problems that come up. The script editor is more remote from the set and dealing almost purely with literary matters. Um, and what's also fascinating to look at then is that let's go down from the script editor and you see there's the lead writer and then who reports to the lead writer? The script department, which I, a term I use rather facetiously, just like the wardrobe department or camera department, not to put in down any of the departments of the HODs, but, uh, um, but the fact is uh, script, uh, the writing is put on a level no greater or no lower than, um, than any of the other de craft departments that go into the creation of, of a show. Um, so where does the power reside? Well, when you follow through from, uh, when you look at the director and the producer's unit, the department heads, the cast, post-production, um, uh, everybody feeds through the producer's unit and the director. Um, one fascinating snapshot is that uh, in the UK, the director, at least on Killing Eve, we did four directors, each doing two a block of two episodes. Um, the director hires her own or his own editor and works with the editor uh, in, in post where the lead writer is not even allowed, not even invited into the editing bay, which to me is very much um, the movie system. The director has a lot more intercourse with the studio and the network. The director deals directly with the cast. The lead writer traditionally has very little uh, conversation with the cast um, uh, in, the, in the sense of being able to change things. If the cast has a problem, uh, it would often go through the story producer or the script. You know, it, it's, it's an elliptical and rather obtuse way of getting changes made. So this is a general portrait, uh, but when we look at the US system, there's the showrunner right at the top, sharing power with the network and the studio. Uh, and the network and studio certainly have a lot to say about what goes on there, and, 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 but, but the fact is, when it comes to the actual organizational hierarchy, look at, look at the next tier. Everybody reports through the showrunner, directly or indirectly. Um, I mean, and there will be some relationships, like the line producer who's responsible for the physical production of a show. They'll be talking independently with the network in the studio, but essentially they're reporting through the showrunner. Um, and so there's a lot of, in, in, a, in a chart like this, there's a lot of other relationships that aren't indicated, but the important point is that the showrunner really is at the top of the pyramid um, and that people, and this is what Brendan's referring to, is that when you see the iceberg and, uh, and you're standing on the bridge, there's nobody to hand off to. Um, you're there and you have to make those decisions. Um, and if you don't, then somebody else will be brought in to make those decisions for you. Um, but uh, anything you want to throw in there, Brendan? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very, brilliant and stark comparison so when when some of this is about terminology when we say showrunner people bandy the phrase in the uk about some of those amazing talented creative people behind those big series that have traveled the world but by and large they're not showrunners in the u.s system they're effectively a very powerful head writer who then delegates usually everything apart from the writing to other people. So it's uh, effectively like a king, king or queen writer rather than a showrunner. And that's why I say, be careful what you wish for to some people. Because of the way the industry built up in, in the UK, a lot of us came out of uh, what I what journalism, for example, but journalism, theater, writing books, you know, you know, TV, TV was not as it is in the States, a giant thing in itself until recently. Yeah, what, what so that, that, that right. headache, sorry, go on. No, no, you finished. I just have one more point to make before I take the slide off. Go ahead. Uh, that, that headache uh, with 
the the British system. So it's it's great if you just if you just want to write, that's fine. But if you say in a US uh, context, I want to be a showrunner, then there is a little flurry of questions that follow. Have you ever spent any time in an editing suite? Because the showrunner is expected to supervise and be the guardian of editing. Do you understand costume? Do you know how to hire and fire actors? Do you know your way around a production spreadsheet for when you're called out of your brilliant, exciting creative writers room meeting to have your network call weekly or daily uh, or your studio call where you're dealing with the people who are funding you know, funding your process. So I remember I sat in on um, uh, a writer's room not too long ago where they were really getting to some good stuff in the story. And something I've seen again and again is that the showrunner says, sorry, I now have to do my studio call. They they depart from uh, from the, the writer's room. They then tend to have a, a very talented, wise old owl who is like a... a deputy showrunner who makes sure that things stay on track and that would be a lot less important in a UK room where the the head writer maybe never never chooses to leave the room when they're doing something creative but on, on if if you're interested in that side of show running then you have to find a way to generate those skills and in the American system people have gone through years of going through almost like an apprenticeship all those jobs they've had a chance to sit in the editing suites they've had a chance to be the voice of the showrunner on the set where that, 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 that was traditionally the way it is the reason why uh, i created the showrunner training program in 2005 uh, is because things were changing so much. I mean, the flip side, I mean, we can, we can rhapsodize about the advantages of each of our other systems. I, I think we, um, but the, the, the flip side of, of that apprenticeship was that um, before the impact of cable, uh, TV development and the broadcast level was very gradual. It was glacial uh, in terms of any kind of progress. And so you had time to learn. When things changed and they began to give responsibilities to writers with less experience, this apprenticeship, this learning the ropes, as you referred to, became, um, less available to people. And so the program was developed to impart some of those skills, the very skills you're talking about, because people aren't generally having the same amount of time, I think on average, that they used to. Uh, the, the reason for it is good because there's so much more emphasis on original material and they want people who are not burnt out. But, but, but the point that you're making is that you need to have those skills and you need to acquire them some way. And the point I wanted to make that's so distinctive in America is that the showrunner hires the editors and the editors report to the showrunner. And in especially in a 22 episode season, um, directors have four days by, you know, in a one hour drama to work with their cut. And then it's turned over to the showrunner and the showrunner takes it home. And so that's just one aspect. And, and the, the editors know uh, over time what a showrunner likes and doesn't like in a cut. And it uh, uh, and you develop a real rapport and shorthand with your editors, and it's and it's brilliant. I mean, I love post production. I mean, post production is where showrunners go to hide because you can avoid all these other things that are going on. And it's dark and it's quiet and it's nice, and and the film's already been shot. And if you like crossword puzzles like I do, it's like okay, all the answers are there. You just got to put it together somehow. But uh, that being said, I mean, post is a tremendous uh, discipline and it's one that, uh, and skill and it, and it, and it takes time to learn it. And um, so the idea is you're saying going from zero to 60 from being a writer who's only been writing in their own garret uh, to suddenly being given responsibilities is there, nobody's equipped for that. And uh, uh, so it's something to be, to be wary of. And maybe that leads us a little bit naturally uh, into a quick discussion about the, the, the qualities, the strengths and, and limitations of a typical British writer to the degree that, that you can talk about it. I'll start and throw it to you. But, but I, uh, when, when, when I was uh, hired on to Killing Eve and working with Suzanne Heathcote, uh, who's a British playwright who has been working in the States for a number of years, um, when, when we were hired, I thought, okay, Suzanne, you're gonna have to read a lot of scripts now to come up with people for your staff. But I was told by uh, Sid Gentle, uh, the production company, that they already had been doing that, and they actually out of they had ten writers they wanted us to read, which I initially really resented because I thought it was the showrunner's prerogative to, in the United States, it is to find out who it is you're going to read. I mean, you can take suggestions from the studio and the network, but um, but basically, but based on your own experiences, you have plenty of people you want to read, and and you and you want to 
get as wide a pool as possible. So I, I had a chip on my shoulder when I read these scripts until I read them. And they were terrific. Pound for pound, these 10 scripts were better than 10 typical American spec scripts I would uh, read. I, they were more original. They were more mature. The craftsmanship was terrific. I thought, this is amazing. Um, and, and I think that that's a product of British writers have to be more self-reliant. They have to show more initiative because you have to scramble more from job to job because you can't attach yourself to a long running show for three or four years um, in most cases. It, it was not unusual to find in my experience a writer who um, not only had just written uh, a radio play uh, and a television series, but had a play on in Manchester, you know, right there. And uh, the versatility and the intelligence uh, uh, was breathtaking to me. The flip side of that is when we got in a room with some of these writers, and they're all lovely people, is there tended to be a certain um, reserve, almost defensiveness on, or resistance on the part of some of them for writing to satisfy another writer's vision, which is what you have to do when you're part of a writer's room. And again, that was a product of they had no experience with it. Uh, and everything in, I think, the typical British writer's experience is teaches them to be wary of uh, trusting anybody or, 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 or getting too divorced from your own sensibility. Uh, um, and there's kind of a poor but proud quality to, uh, uh, to, to being this labor. Okay, you know, I may not get paid as much, I may not, but I'm proud of what I'm doing and I'm gonna fight to protect it. Um, and every writer, uh, certainly I can recall in my own career, a, a tremendous learning curve when you first are hired on writing staff and realize that the job is to be collaborative and nobody's attacking you in the best sense. That's just trying to get the work to a certain place. And if you can take the advantage of six other really great people in the room, um, um, then uh, uh, that's all to the good. But normally we're pretty defensive and say, no, it's my job to write it. And to the degree that anybody has a suggestion, it's a criticism of what I've done. It's a, anyway, to you. Yeah, I, I agree completely. There's, um, you know, we all have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, just to finish on the previous point, if people are more interested in being showrunners or taking a lead, there are ways for UK people who don't have the experience of going through a, a big uh, TV machine. Uh, for instance, I came out of, you know, I was a writer, producer, director in features, so I knew about producing features, I knew about directing features. So you can you can bring whatever skills, if you're used to making shorts and so on, if you know the the editing process or the economic process, just where we are in the UK now is, uh, you know, stand on any dunghill if it gives you elevation. If you've done something, if you've had one of those experiences, no matter where it comes from, if it comes out of theatre, if it comes from books or journalism, whatever, just you know try to try to learn those bits of the business which are not about being patronized and put in the corner and told right you're the writer right thank you there's your small bag of money your work here is done just that you have to somehow get from that to being part of a big outward looking industry with lots of different skill sets and it is it is possible but it's not easy so just sort of saddle up for that particular journey then uh, coming on to uh, uh, what we were just talking about, uh, and I know time is pressing, but the, the one of the difference in rooms is that the American rooms were based on the industrialization of writing, and it was a brilliant system. It was the same system that created Motown, the music. It was based on the, the automotive assembly lines. And then Motown did the same thing with creating hits, the hit factory, Hitsville, USA. Uh, and in the 60s in particular, when there were very large runs, it made total sense that you needed a small army of very well-coordinated people to deliver them. But we're, we're now in a world, particularly with the streamers, where people aren't taking big risks on long runs. That might change, but for now... In Europe in particular, we're talking about six episodes, eight episodes, 10 episodes is now uh, regarded as war and peace. And uh, that's a completely different world. So uh, within that environment, you need smaller writers' rooms. That's not to say the, the uh, American Guild and hats off to it is fighting the good fight for to make sure its people aren't shortchanged, but in truth, maybe sometimes we need to be paid in different ways 
if you're not if you're not doing 20 episodes you know you, you still need to make a living uh and if you're doing six episodes i i for one hate working in rooms where there's too many people uh but, you know generally if you're doing six episodes and you have four or five great minds in a room then you can get a lot further a lot faster and also you don't have the advantage of being able to if you've got a run of 22 you know everyone can get two episodes or three episodes to write and that makes economic sense but if you're writing six some i mean sometimes i'm doing, doing something with my friends in uh, uh finland and germany and it's it's uh six episodes and i'm writing all six because it is actually better and smarter and faster to do that if if you've got a relationship it's based on a book and i have a strong relationship with the original author and we can go back and forth so that actually makes sense whereas in uh in other development i'm working on you have to have other people for instance i just finished something with uh china with croton watse they uh, they were a bit crestfallen when I only talked about doing 12 episodes because a normal first season run in China for their streamers is up to 60, 60 hours. Yeah, I so mean, when you, when you, when you look, we look around the world, like in Mexico, 120 episodes, things like that. But uh, I, th I think a point to, to be taken is there, there's now a great variety of different circumstances that writers will find themselves in, in these mini rooms, which doesn't necessarily mean a smaller number of writers, but it means it's for a more limited time. Um, those have become more popular in the United States, not because writers like them, but because the studios like them, especially in the in a short order where they want most of the scripts written before production begins. Um, that's that's created its own set of problems because uh, the very qualities you were talking about of apprenticeship are being denied writers because they'll be in a room, the scripts will get written, you might write your own script, but then you don't get to see it through. Uh, and so one of the things in talking to showrunners in the United States and something that we've incorporated in the, in the showrunner program talking about how to protect yourself is to make sure that you're allowed to carry at least one writer over into the actual production season uh, so that you can have somebody to help you with rewrites. Otherwise, what happens for those who haven't been in involved in something like this is that you may have your six scripts and then you get into pre-production and production and suddenly you find you have to make changes. Very often it's for purely physical reasons. It's too expensive. It can't be done. Sometimes it's for reasons that the actors are having difficulty. It just isn't working as well as it could be. Somebody's got to be doing those rewrites. And if you have no staff together, that's going to be you. Um, yeah. So that happens. And also I was going to make a, just one other point, And then I think Kay may want to jump in here um, is that uh, uh, in your case, talking about writing all the episodes, which is certainly understandable uh, if you're adapting literary material and you can see it and it's just more efficient uh, for you to write six. But if that becomes a longer running series that outlives the books, for example, um, you may find the benefit of having a room that can help you plot and write the rest of it. I've said this, I, I love Downton Abbey, uh, especially the first season or two. I felt it got tired and repetitive, and I felt to my eyes, with complete respect and no for Julian Fellows and no, no wish to, to diss it, I felt it could have benefited from people, from a room that could have generated, my sense was, and I don't know what actually happened, my sense was, it could have, been, it could have benefited from a room that would have said, what about this, 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 and this, and given him the benefit of choosing any number of different ideas, as opposed to repeating certain tropes. Anyway, so, anyway, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> great, great. No, I'd love to jump in because we're getting loads of questions. So I'd love to be able to get through as many as we can. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for those that have sent through questions. We'll get through as many of we, as, as we can now. Um, so could you give any advice on working with American production companies or international um, regarding navigating things like structure, systems, time zones? Hmm. I can say one thing on it, which is that I, because I've got so many different things in development, my life consists of sort of, you know, rolling out of bed too early and going to bed too late because you'd be dealing, if you're dealing with China and America and Scandinavia, uh, you know, everyone wants their answer when they're awake. Uh, my one piece of advice is just to set, set boundaries you know say you know i i know you may be somewhere else but i'm here and i will answer between these hours so yeah i guess uh, my, that's interesting you're, you're talking from the producer's side from a writer's side i'd say set no boundaries be willing to do anything anytime <laughs> that uh, uh from an american point of view americans don't understand 
that uh, what the time difference is, and they don't really care, I think. So the typical American studio or production company uh, will quickly get impatient if they find that they can't get people on the phone when they want it. Um, uh, and so from a producer's point of view or the degree you have authority, I agree it's very important to set boundaries. In reality, I think especially depending on where you are in the totem pole, the more flexibility, uh, the more willingness you express to, uh, 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 to do what needs to be done, uh, the faster you'll rise in the American system. Yeah, that's, that's uh, right. My caveat is that I'm a grumpy old git. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, another question. So, where might someone such as Chris Shibnall or Sally Wainwright sit in the hierarchy as you've described it in the UK, as obviously they're also lead writer and obviously Sally directs now and uh, Chris is a showrunner so where, where would you see them sitting in that hierarchy of your slide yeah. well with, without uh, you know obviously I can't I can't speak for them but in general I think there are very powerful creative forces who either because of their experience or their choice choose not to be in charge of everything they choose not to be king of the world that doesn't mean that if if they want something to happen differently, you know, if if they basically put their foot down about something, it will happen. So there's a sort of dotted line that you you know with that top layer of effectively head writers who are sometimes called showrunners, but who aren't doing all these other functions. There are producers in the UK doing them, there are directors doing them. So all of those things are happening, but if you know, if uh, if Sally Wainwright wanted something to be a certain way on Gentleman Jack, then, you know, and lo, it would happen, and the people working around her would... And I'd say that structurally what she's done by becoming a director is put herself at the head of the class, because the director does hold tremendous power, in my observation, in, in the British yeah. system. And so um, I, I think that that automatically gives her a certain authority that... Uh, uh, that allows her to dictate things. I don't know. Je I don't know. If Jed's directed, uh, but uh, but even no, even I something like Jed. Is just I talk. Yeah, I talked to to one one of the, again. I don't just because I haven't asked him permission. But uh, 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 one of those big players uh, quite recently said to me, you know, someone comes to me and they wave two costumes in front of me, and I say, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just a writer, but. In reality, if that person wanted to have an input on that, as they would if they were a U.S. showrunner, they they can do so. I see somebody said that Jed, yeah, that, that Jed has directed a lot, which which makes sense to me. But I've never directed. I directed a lot of theater before I got involved with television and uh, in, in my undergraduate days. But but from my perspective in the American system, okay, the the. Uh, uh, I don't need to direct because I get to do everything except to actually say, uh, you know, roll camera and cut. Um, and in fact, I once jokingly, but not too jokingly said to a friend of mine who was the director producer on a show I was working on is that when I send you the script, it's like, I've already sent you the film. I just want you to develop it and send it back to me. And which he didn't appreciate, but, uh, uh, but, and, and I didn't quite mean it, but, but the fact is there was enough meaning there to say that the director there, the job is just, uh, in fact, in my early days in television, I was told make a script director proof, just, Make sure that they can't fuck it up. Pardon my French, but they can't screw it up to a degree that uh, uh, that it's not recognizable. But um, but even Jed, I, I just want to share this because I learned something from him. He, he talked about uh, even within the British system that what he's looking for, he says it's not power. He said uh, per se, I'm looking to have as much influence on the finished product as I can have. And I thought that was very wise. And it's something I've told people back in America as things have changed too, that regardless of whether you're just in the lead writer's position or directing, it's still, I think it's helpful not to think of it in terms of power struggle, but things of, can I influence the result? It also will save you, I think, some ulcers uh, because- um, Yeah, I, 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 the one thing yeah. I chip in on that is that it's it's very important for everyone to know who's in charge at any given moment and what they're in charge of and that one of the problems working across uk and largely in europe is that sometimes a director will think that actually okay i've got the script that's just a nice starting point for me now i'll do whatever i want because they're from an auteur uh, theatrical tradition in america there are many many jobbing episode directors who are brilliant at what they do 
and they see their job as delivering the vision of the showrunner. Right. That would be the case in some of Europe. So, and, uh, you know, I'm not saying one system is, is a work of genius and the other is rubbish. It's just about people knowing where the buck stops. And quite often in Europe, because of different cultural uh, differences, people don't have those conversations up front where they need to, so that everyone everyone knows that if it's not a big surprise if there's an argument between a showrunner and the director both of them should know who's getting to make a final decision and that's not about sort of being obsessed with power or or structure it's just about like if you're in an army you need to know who the general is right. or who you know, and, the, captain and is. the more the more that the, the more that it's a traditional type of production setup in the united states the more you can exercise that but the lines are getting blurred yeah. Uh, as directors, uh, because you're right, uh, typically a feature director coming to episodic television would have a rude shock about the amount of authority and, uh, that they have. But, um, but as the influence, <clears throat> curiously, the influence of some of the best British product and, and the best American product seems to be tipping towards the director having more influence, I think, about true, you know, true detective and things like that in America, where the director had a heavy hand in that. It's, it's, it's confusing. I, um, I just offer this quick anecdote that Matt Damon, I heard him speak a while ago about when he was a young actor, he would always choose his movie projects based on the script. But after a few experiences, he said, now I choose to buy the director. Because in his experience, the way that movies are made, the director ultimately has more to do with how the thing comes out than where the script begins. And, um, and to the degree that American movies are showing more, American television is showing movie influence, I can understand that. I'm not thrilled by it, but it's, it's just to say that it's, it's, I think one of the takeaways from this is it's not black and white. Um, both sides of the Atlantic are changing. Both have things to offer one another. But I do think to the degree that I think I saw a question pop up about uh, can the American model really work in, in the UK? And I think it can't. Uh, I think as long, there's just, if you go back to those slides, there's just too much hardwired into the infrastructure to believe that a typical British approach can be rewired to be an American approach. Um, what I think is more likely is that more American shows will be being shot on British soil through the American type of infrastructure. So it's important to understand it. You know, it's been absolutely insightful, brilliant session, and I'm sure we've all we've all learned a, a huge amount. And um, but thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you again shortly. I hope.